Hello. In this coming video series, I will be looking at a number of books that have been seminal in the study of magic and the occult in the Aztec world, from the ancient, the colonial, to the te contemporary times. And each of the works that I will be looking at will shed light on a particular angle of this larger subject. And so that will be the focus of each of the books and the article that will be coming up in the forthcoming series. Some of the topics that will be explored in this series include Aztec theories of the human body and its ability to use magic, supernatural beings, ritual language, as well as methodological questions concerning the ways in which this knowledge has been passed down to the present day, the role of the anthropologist in collecting knowledge from colonial to the modern period. Most of the videos will be unscripted and freestyle, and so I invite you to join me as I return to one of my favorite subjects in this Eye of the Serpent video series. If you're familiar with the Western Hermetic traditions, you may know the famous principle of as above, so below. I would venture to say that in Mesoamerica, there is a very similar principle, but it could be reworded to say as without, so within. That is to say that the human body is very much a microcosm of the greater universal forces that govern the cosmos. And so to understand the nature of the human body, it is also important to understand the larger cosmic patterns, the forces of nature that guide the formation of the world as well as the formation of the human body. And one book that really nails this point is The Natural History of the Soul in Ancient Mexico by Jill Leslie McKeever first. And this book has some wonderful commentaries on the ways in which observations of nature uh, within the human body as could relate to observations of nature beyond. So there was this kind of isomorphism, this kind of analogy between the world's beyond of the the, the world uh, beyond the human body, as well as the workings of the world within. And also much to say about the intersections, the communication between the forces within and without. Uh, for example, the ways in which the soul, the breath, could migrate uh, out of the body and also return within it. And these are very important concepts relate, uh, that pertain to ideas of health. To, for a human body to be healthy, it has to be, have a spiritual, social, and psychic integrity. And so this book is a very meticulous study that it looks at these ideas and it has some fascinating illustrations such as this uh, very well-known illustration of the 20 days of the Aztec calendar and how they could conceptually relate to the organs of the human body. And so here is an example of the ways in which cosmic patterns imprinted upon the human form. And this is a very important idea. It there has some discussion of witchcraft, shamanism, sorcery, but these are in light of the larger idea of to understand the ways in which Aztecs and other indigenous Mesoamericans could use power, could wield magic, it is important to understand the ways in which they conceptualize their body. What is their body made of and therefore what is it capable of doing? If you can understand the ways in which the uh, various forces, the psychic entities that are within the body could be manipulated, projected into the outer world, then you have an idea of the ways in which shamanism was understood to operate. Ways in which energy could be cultivated or circulated both within the body or even transferred into other phenomena could also explain ways in which the Aztecs and other peoples used ritual in order to empower their devices or to make things um, efficient to cast magic into the world. So you have to understand ways in which power could be uh, generated and released from within and beyond the confines of the physical human body. And that's why I find this book is especially useful for understanding these ideas. And many of the uh, terms come distinctly from the Nahuatl language of the Aztecs. It uses many archeological pieces, but it also draws from colonial and contemporary ethnographic studies. So it is a pan Mesoamerican uh, uh, ethnological work that is drawing from many Many different regions of Mesoamerica. There are references to the Aztec, to the Maya, um, 
to the Mixtec and other uh, indigenous societies from ancient, colonial, and modern times. And so it brings these together to create some sort of coherent, consistent uh, discussion of a general idea uh, in, uh, among the uh, societies of the old and the new and ways by which we can combine these different studies to provide some sort of integrated and holistic model for viewing for, for understanding the human body and its um and, and the ways in which energies and um and and other forces promote its health well-being as well as its ability to use magic and power and to perform ritual in the world around Although we know much about the ancient Aztec world from the archaeological record, we are also heavily indebted to the works of the colonial scholars who were interviewing the uh, Aztecs who lived during the ages before the conquest. And one of the most important of these scholars was Friar Bernardino de Sahagún, whose 12 book work, The General History of the Things of New Spain, or the Florentine Codex, is one of the most seminal and important volumes that we have for understanding Understanding the ancient Aztec world, at least as it was remembered during the first decades after the colonial period. There is a lot of controversy over the reliability of these sources, especially when uh, th those interviewed by the 1570s were already two generations after the conquest of um, Tenochtitlan. And so with 50 years of uh, time span between the conquest and the period of the interviews, a lot of things may have been distorted or kind of reworked in memory. And so some of, we, we have to be very cautious in the reliability of these uh, data. However, at the same time, this is an invaluable resource for understanding the Aztec world and the, this encyclopedia of Aztec life and natural history is broken down into 12 major books. And this paperback edition is part of the series that was published by the University of Utah Press, uh, edited and translated by Charles Dibble and Arthur J. O. Anderson. And their work provides a transcript of the original Nahuatl with a pretty concise English translation. It's not perfect. There are some places where I think it could be uh, worded a little better. But in any case, if you want to look at the original Nahuatl, this is a pretty legible and uh, very faithful uh, re uh, reproduction of the original text. I will also throw in a, a link to the uh, full facsimile that I found online. Intla in kineki which is to say that if you want to try to read it in the original Nahuatl. So um, what I'd also like to illustrate uh, with this par uh, particular volume is uh, volume or, or books four and five are particularly relevant to the Aztec ideas of magic, sorcery, and divination. In fact, uh, book four is entirely dedicated to the ancient Aztec calendar. This is a concept that I will be uh, delving into in another um, in another video, but at least for now, and uh, I bring it up here because it has a lot to say about the ways in which um, horoscope readers, uh, trained professionals, uh, priests, and diviners could could read the 260-day ceremonial count. And I have, and there's actually an illustration, um, actually a series of illustrations that uh, attempted to explain the organization of the 13 numerals and the 20 calendar days and how they combined to produce the 260-day ceremonial round. This was a mythical cycle that operated independently of the uh, full solar year, but that's a subject for another video. Uh, at least for now, it's uh, important to understand that these uh, astrologers, diviners, were using the calendar in order to predict the outcome of a person's birth. Uh, Book four has a lot to say about the rituals that were performed at uh, different moments of this 260-day calendar, but also the ways in which the energies of the calendar could converge upon a person at the, at the day of their birth. So depending on what number and what day sign you were born under would inform the um, your career, your disposition, your life. And on a few cases, that even included the uh, pr predicting the birth of a sorcerer, such as the seventh 13-day cycle was named after the first day of that count, which was one rain, one storm. And it actually has a lot of 
detail about the outcome of a person born on this day. He would be destined to become a Nawali, a shapeshifter, or a Tetlachiwiani. This was a person who cast sorcery. Tetlachiwiistli literally means to do uh, doing things upon people. And this was a very general way of uh, for the Aztecs to define sorcery. Uh, book five is about the omens and the premonitions that surrounded the world because the Aztecs w were very much a, a uh, believed in the spiritual realities of the natural phenomena around them. They had a very spiritually based concept of magic. That is to say that the world was animated with gods, spirits, ghosts, and many other sorts of supernatural, superhuman entities that had some degree of influence in the natural world, the social world, and in some cases, even matters of health. And uh, to give an example, I want to uh, bring, return to these illustrations because on the uh, last set, you have, um, again, some of the text and also some of the full color illustrations from the original um, uh, manuscript. And if you look at the top right, you see a really nice rendition of an owl. The owl was a premonition of death. It was a representative of the underworld. It worked on behalf of the gods of death. And so this uh, chapter talks about the kinds of omens that these phenomena could bring into the world, and then also even ways by which to undo them or to prevent them. So if an owl were to come and its uh, hooting were seen as a premonition that somebody in the household would die, then there were rituals that would uh, insult and uh, shoo away the owl in order to undo those effects. So the, even though the natural world was filled with these terrifying omens, these frightening things, especially uh, that uh, uh, took place in the night, there were at least many remedies. There were ritual and magical ways to avert or prevent their outcome. I also wanted to show a few other illustrations from this particular page because they're just a really fascinating kind of menagerie of the different kinds of supernatural forces that existed beyond the, the Aztec society. These were things that typically dwelled in the wilderness and came out of night. The headless um, axeman, the dwarf, the tall man, just this wonderful menagerie of different superhuman beings that were rumored to exist beyond the reckonings of the regular natural world, the social world that everybody was familiar and comfortable with. Another thing that could be said about this work is that Bernardino de Sahagún was very sympathetic. He was trying to understand the Aztec world and presented in, there was some degree of bias. So that's something that we always have to be careful of when we look at these uh, colonial sources is that because they're coming from an evangelical, a Christian perspective, they're trying to undo the religion. And so they are going to be casting a lot of these um, views in very negative light. In many places, he actually used uses or attempts to use a, a term for the devil uh, by using the uh, so-called man-owl, the tlacatecolot. But uh, despite his aversion to some of the uh, traditional uh, Aztec religious practices, he still is trying to be sympathetic uh, to and, and trying to prov uh, provide, in some respects, a fair and unbiased uh, look at the uh, ways in which the Aztecs themselves described their own history which is very different from the next book that we'll be looking at. A century after the conquest of Mexico, the Aztecs who survived the original conquest um, continued to live in remote rural villages. And while the church was pretty relaxed when it came to sending missionaries such as friars, priests, bishops to evangelize, to introduce Christianity to this new native population, they were pretty uh, okay as long as the people were following the basic sacraments. One particular uh, area of southern Mexico uh, was uh, studied by Hernando Ruiz del Alarcón back in the uh, early 17th century. And because of his a very um, determined and rather aggressive uh, uh, program of uh, uh, of collecting Aztec religion that uh, we have this volume on the 
practices that were still being performed this far into the colonial period. So even after a century of conquest, there were many aspects of the Aztec religion that were still uh, being practiced. And this was a deep concern for Hernando Duriz de Alarcón because he saw this as a corruption of the true Christian faith. And so he actually went about many of the villages between the southern states of Morelos and Guerrero and um, in order to find out what they were still doing uh, pertaining to the uh, traditional ancient Aztec religion. And he found that they were uh, in many places following traditional uh, healing rituals, uh, divination, oracles, uh, beliefs in magical beings such as witches, shapeshifters, uh, uh, vampires, and many other kinds of superhuman beings. And so he wanted to um, combine all of these discoveries. He wanted to uh, put, uh, assemble all of these surviving uh, beliefs into a single volume so that he could present it to the uh, Christian authorities and say, look, these people are still practicing idolatries that have no place in the Christian church. And if they're going to be true Christians, we need to identify these uh, contaminations, these old vestiges of their ancient religion, and we, in, in order to remove them. So while he was composing this volume in order to ultimately extricate to remove and eradicate those uh, remnants of the Aztec religion, we today are using these in order to attempt to reconstruct what the Aztecs were um, practicing and largely from the rural communal perspective. A lot of what these uh, rituals entail pertain to the survival of the communal life. These are the, This is the kind of magic that the villagers were doing <clears throat> And it has much to do with matters of divination, oracles, um, health, healing, uh, food production, hunting. These were things that related to the survival of the human body as well as the survival of the culture and the society. And we have to be very careful with this work. This is one of the most controversial works that scholars have used in order to reconstruct traditional Aztec religion because uh, Risa Larcon was not reserved with some of the more questionable and unethical uh, means of collecting his information. We, we have cases where he uh, collected a material on sword point or through deception. And so in, in some cases, um, it was uh, with great distortion. Uh, so we have to be very careful with this and uh, because of the rather unethical ways by which much of this material was collected, which is unfortunate because on the one hand, this can tell us a great amount of the kinds of ritual and magical um, uh, practices that the Aztecs were uh, continuing to use into the colonial period and that could relate to traditional, uh, like say, domestic magic from before the conquest. But we have to be very careful with this. The uh, Hasig and Andrews edition is very Im uh, important because it is a, a thorough exploration of the original Nahuatl and comparing it with the <clears throat> transcription from Risto de Kuan himself. And you can see some examples where it, the text has first his uh, Risto Alarcón's uh, attempt to write it in Nahuatl and then his own translation into Spanish. And then uh, Andrews and Hasig provide their own transcription, how the Nahuatl should have originally read and their own more direct and literal translation that avoids the bias and some of the errors in uh, Ruiz de Alarcón's original uh, translation. The University of Oklahoma edition also has uh, not only the uh, original six uh, treatises that uh, by, by which this uh, book is organized, but also a number of appendices, such as uh, some of the major gods and goddesses that are evoked through these rituals, and also even a glossary of the ritual terms, the magical and ritual practitioners, and uh, some of the uh, various uh, phrases and ideas that uh, we have to understand in order to realize the ways in which the uh, rural Aztecs of the 17th century were uh, reckoning and practicing magic. 
The Ruiz de Larcón's uh, treatise has been heavily studied, especially for the role of language in Aztec ritual. The language in these works is heavily metaphoric and deeply symbolic. It often invokes uh, references to mythical episodes, or it uses language in order to transform uh, modern, like say, contemporary or just mundane objects into things of literally mythical power. And they will use this by evoking the names of uh, powerful gods, or they will even use some of the number and uh, ca uh, day sign uh, aspects of the calendar in order to now give whatever instruments they're uh, trying to enhance a, a literally mythical uh, level of power. And so this um, work has been especially useful for understanding the ways in which language could be used in order to evoke ritual and magical power in the Aztec world. Now, I cannot have a video series on Aztec magic and occultism without mentioning one of the definitive works on the subject, namely Miguel Leon Portilla's Cuarenta Clases de Magos en el Mundo Nahuatl, or 40 Classes of Magicians in the Nahuatl World. And this is a comprehensive study, a review of the colonial literature and vocabularies in order to elucidate a list of 40 different categories that he uh, explores in great detail, dedicating a, an extensive amount of comparative literature from different sources across the colonial period. And I will give you some examples with uh, the upcoming screenshots. But one thing I'd like to say before we go into it is that he, a point he makes is that rather than regarding each of these 40 categories as a distinct type of magician, he uh, would rather say, that these are different possible faculties. So a Nawali could be just as well a diviner or a caster of weather, as well as possessing the infamous ability to transform into an animal. And so there was a variety of different abilities that one particular magician could or could not have. And so now what I'd like to do is show a couple of examples by looking at the classic Nawali, which uh, Leon Portilla uh, describes with a uh, very rigorous uh, research. I am not going to belabor the topic of the Nawali because this is a subject that I find so interesting and complex that I would rather dedicate some other videos toward the subject. At least for now, what I'd like to look at is how Leon Portilla explores and analyzes the concept of the Nawali, beginning with a study of the etymology, some possible origins of the Nawali name according to the rules of the Aztec grammar, the Nahuatl language. And so you can see the various sources that he uses uh, it, from both uh, colonial and contemporary uh, references. You look at uh, footnote 44, where he uh, cites Ruiz de Larcón, who we just were just looking at in the uh, previous video. Feel free to pause the video at any point if you would like to uh, read any uh, of this content, but I will also provide a link to a PDF version of this file. At least for now, notice that um, on this page, he references the works of Friar Bernardino de Sahagún, who we were just talking about two videos ago. And here is a a interlinear, a side-by-side -side comparison of the Nahuatl with a Spanish translation. <clears throat> and this part comes from Book 10 of the Florentine Codex that we were uh, discussing in uh, a previous video. And you can see the ways by which he uses the colonial sources from uh, many different uh, writers in order to make some general analytical remarks about the concept and the ways in which the uh, Aztecs understood and regarded it. So in the page 98, he also begins to talk about the tonali, which is a very a complex subject in itself. It is a kind of soul that the Aztecs believed was related to the faculties of sensory perception and consciousness. And this too is a really interesting subject that I would like to dedicate to another video. But you can see that he is combining and intersecting these ideas of Tona and Nawali in order to understand their possible uh, conceptual connections. While many of the categories in this article do have Nahuatl terms, in other cases, there are simply descriptions that have uh, been passed down from a Spanish attempt to describe the subject. 
And you can see that he cites a number of different sources. So this is also a good starting point if you want to look at any of the particular primary sources from the colonial or ethnographic uh, references that he amply lists uh, throughout this article. Reviewing this section from Sahagun's Book 10 reminds me of some of the cautions that we must apply when we are using these colonial sources. If you look at the description of the Nawali on the bottom half of page 97, you see that it begins with some of the virtues and qualities of the good Nawali, the, as a wise man, as a counselor, as a, a repository of knowledge. However, it then follows with a description of the evil Nawali. And I'm going to highlight one of my favorite lines here, it's a two, it kind of the second half of the section where it says in tlaweli lok nawali tlatiwale which is to say the despised, the wicked Nawali is a possessor of sortilages, is a possessor of sorcery, one who casts spells or does things uh, to other people. And so this is a really um, very vivid description of the Nawali as one of the quintessential magicians of the ancient uh, Aztec world, one that has survived uh, well into the modern day. But again, I'd like to go into the subject in uh, future videos. The fact that Bernardino de Sahagún has broken down this description of the Nawali into good and bad forms is a holdover from old European conventions for the organization of knowledge. And so here again, if we even look at the genre, the way in which this native knowledge has been composed into an encyclopedia reminds us of the European constructs that have been imposed upon traditional native knowledge. And so these are the kinds of cautions that we must, uh, again, be very careful with as we are using these colonial sources in order to understand indigenous categories. A very important point that has to be made about the Aztecs is that although their civilization was felled in the 16th century, the people are still very much around. In fact, the uh, Nahuatl language has over one and a half million speakers, which makes it the most widely spoken indigenous language in Mexico, and one of the largest uh, Native American languages in the entire uh, hemisphere. And there have been many ethnographic studies, uh, anthropologists going into distinct communities in order to understand the culture, the traditions, the livelihood, even the languages of the um, peoples that are uh, still in many parts of Mexico. And this includes uh, many studies of contemporary Aztec communities. One of the most important of these studies has been Corners Are Blood by Alan Sandstrom. And this book has been a very important uh, source for understanding the Aztecs in the northeast part of Mexico, the Huasteca region that is near the Gulf of Mexico. And I will talk about the Huasteca in another video. Uh, there are um, uh, many aspects of the Huasteca that have uh, pertained to my own research. I actually did my dissertation in the Huasteca area. And so this is a place that's near and dear to my heart because I actually have um, been to some of the communities and areas that Sandstrom has described in this book. Uh, he uses the uh, name uh, Amatlan as a pseudonym to uh, hide the identity of the actual village, uh, which is in the um, municipio, the county of um, Iscuatlan de Madero, and which has um, many Otomi villages, but um, I will talk about that also in uh, for, for uh, future videos. Uh, at least for now, I bring this one up because uh, while the book is itself a full monograph, a, a comprehensive look at the culture, the practices, the society of the uh, community of Am Amatlan, there are many sections that are dedicated specifically to the ritual and magical practices. And I wanted to uh, highlight two particular examples that I thought were uh, really interesting. This is an illustration of the kinds of oracles that could could be uh, uh, performed by casting corn. This is a very old oracular practice that goes back to the ancient Aztec and Maya uh, periods, where uh, by casting grain, you could uh, know something about the world beyond your conventional sight. And uh, here are some images that could indicate possible readings for the ways in which uh, grains uh, could be scattered and clumped and then read to indicate a particular kind of sign. There, here again is the, uh, a way in which the forces of the outer world could be made legible uh, in, in ways that a trained practitioner could read and therefore divine. And um, 
One thing that I find interesting about this is that uh, it even includes uh, augurs for or omens for uh, understanding when sorcery is at play, when black magic could be at foot. And so there were ways by which people could use ritual in order to identify and counter the magical rituals performed by others. Another interesting part of this book, there is a substantial section of this book that is dedicated to the paper cut figurines, the gods and the spirits that populate the uh, rural world of the Aztecs in this part of Mexico. And the paper figurines are a really fascinating tradition that uh, is an also another video topic because I have so much material on the subject from both my own field work and also other aspects of my research. And here are some examples of the spiritual beings such as the fire, the mermaid, the stars, the sun, uh, the forces of the underworld that could be personified, that could be anthropomorphized, made to look like human forms. And this is a very important part of the ritual practices. These figures are then used to placate the spirits that they represent. And so through ritual offerings, chicken sacrifices, egg uh, uh, scatterings, uh, 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 casting beer and coffee and uh, bread, uh, very elaborate rituals that are involved in uh, appealing to these forces in order to make things right in the world, to restore health, to bring rain, to uh, foster the growth of corn, the things that matter. And so this uh, book has an extensive discussion of the ways in which uh, magical and ritual practices are uh, fundamental. So what we can say with uh, studies like this is that to look at what is being done in the Aztec magical ritual is a very important window into understanding the things that matter most in the Aztec world, the things that you need to survive off of. You need your food, you need your shelter, you need your health, you need the things that are going to ensure that your family survives, that your community survives, that your culture survives. And so by looking at magic, we can learn a lot about the things that matter most, the priorities of Aztec culture from the ancient to the modern times. Around the turn of the 1970s, anthropologist Timothy Canab was conducting field work among the communities of the Sierra region of Northern Puebla. This mountain range has been relatively isolated for a very long time, and it contained pockets of indigenous cultures such as the Aztec, the Otomi, and the Totonac. While he was conducting fieldwork in this area, he was focusing on ritual language in discourse. He was looking at metaphorical languages and other aspects of rhetoric. During the course of his fieldwork, Kanab began to realize that some of his older participants seemed to know a surprising amount of knowledge about how to hex, poison, curse, and heal people, which he kind of brushed to the side at first until, by various circumstances, he began to start having dreams of his own that began to that uh, made him curious about some of the history of the uh, these communities in the Sierra region. And as he began to uh, go deeper into this investigation, he started to realize and uncover that back in the 1930s, there had been a blood feud between two major factions in the region between Quetzalan and San Martin Sinacapan that uh, had been kind of left as a dirty secret nobody talked about. But he began to understand this and uncover it for himself be, uh, through his own practices as he was learning from one of the elder consultants who was teaching him that if he was going to uh, have a place in healing and improving the lives of other people around of some of the other villagers, he needed to uh, learn some of the magical ways by which to uh, retrieve souls, by which to uh, restore energies and um, other aspects of ritual healing that uh, the, his uh, consultants were imparting to him. An account of his work appears in his book, A War of Witches, which came out in 1995. And this is an extraordinary tale that in a sense brings together many of the themes that I have explained in some of the previous sections of this video. Now, for example, ways in which the Aztecs have conceptualized different aspects of souls and other psychic uh, faculties within the human body and what they are capable of, which uh, parts of them are able to travel into other worlds. This, it, some aspects 
topics of this chapter are textbook shamanism. Timothy Kanab himself describes some of his own experiences as uh, during his dreams when his own psychic form uh, leaves his body and enters the underworld. And through these travels, he begins to uncover more secrets about the history of the violence that had inflicted this area back in the 1930s. And so he begins to use some of the very magical practices that he was researching in order to learn more about the history and come to a, some final realizations about what had happened, who was accountable, and uh, what uh, and, and how to heal the uh, village from here on. And his own role as a healer also be, uh, uh, be, starts to come into play. And he realizes that as he is beginning to learn how to wield and to practice magic on his own, uh, on his own, he now has a responsibility to use it appropriately. This book also relates to matters of supernatural entities, ceremonial language, the spirit world, and uh, many other topics that I have uh, looked at in uh, discussions of the previous works in this video. And so this is a really nice way of bringing it all together. It is a compelling read and highly recommended. This is a wonderful view of not only the supernatural world as a contemporary Aztec society envisions it, but also the people who are able to engage with it and the role of the anthropologist in as a participant and the extent to which the anthropologist should be involved in these uh, ethical questions concerning the nature of power and knowledge and communal responsibility. Arguably, the most important aspect of magic that is explored in A War of Witches is the role of the Nahuatl, that is, a kind of spirit double that exists in some sense independently of a human person, but also is psychically connected to him. There is a sympathetic rapport between the experiences of the human and the animal that if uh, the, the experiences of one ultimately affect those of the other. And this is a very important idea. This is a an agent that is able to to travel into the underworld, the spirit world. And this is uh, brought into very vibrant in, uh, detail in uh, Kanab's account of A War of Witches, in which he describes not only his own experiences of uh, having a Nawal, but also encountering those of people who are traveling about the spirit world, as well as the spirits of the deceased who are still there among them. And so this is a really interesting kind of contemporary take on a very ancient uh, uh, pre-Columbian um, idea that is found in many Mesoamerican cultures from the Olmec, the Maya, the Aztec, and others. And one of the things that impressed me the most about A War of Witches is its explicit connections to the mythology and the magic of the ancient Aztec world. We find, for example, the deepest levels of the underworld are called Mikitalan, which is clearly cognate with the Aztec Mictlan for the land of the dead. The larger underworld realm is called Talokan, which is related to Tlaloc, the god of rain, and one of the denizens of the underworld, which brings us now to today's mask. Today's mask comes from the Great Temple of the Aztecs in Mexico City. Discovered in a cache near the colossal sculpture of the earth goddess Tlaltegutli, this miniature ensemble includes a statuette with delicately carved and painted wooden accessories. The original paint is remarkably preserved from over 500 years ago. At the sides are two of Tlaloc's essential instruments, the serpent staff symbolizing lightning, and the fanned jar providing waters for Aztec crops. Returning to the writing of the 16th century friar Bernardino de Sahagún, we find an epithet for Tlaloc calling him Nahualpili, the noble Nahuali. This reinforces the magical quality of his divine powers. Earlier in this video series, I discussed the works of Hernando Riz de Alarcón, whose treatise on the heathen superstitions also includes an Aztec villager spell to undo the sickness associated with excess lust. The magician healer identifies himself as a priest and as Nahualtegutli, Nahuali Lord. Remember how I mentioned that these spells often transformed mundane events into mythical actions in order to give them a magical field. In this spell, the lust-induced sickness is symbolically likened to green and white forms of the rain god Tlaloc, and the magician must be mighty enough to hold such powerful beings away from the patient. 
These examples remind us how important the historical literature has been for reconstructing Aztec beliefs about magic from the ancient to the modern day. Thank you for following me on this book review series and good roads.